So let's talk now about what bisoprolol can be used to treat. So I've written a list of five things here that we're going to work through. So let's start with hypertension at the top there. So hypertension is the medical word for high blood pressure. This is a problem that loads of people get as they get older in life, typically after the age of 50. It means that the pressure of the blood inside your arteries is too high. And this is a problem because that high pressure can damage the wall of the arteries and lead to vascular disease such as atherosclerosis or aneurysms. The two main risk factors for it are age, so the older you get, the more likely you are to have high blood pressure. And then being overweight is the second major risk factor. So when you see someone young who has too high blood pressure, usually the reason for that is that they are very overweight. And if they were to lose weight, usually the high blood pressure would resolve. So there are loads of different drugs available to treat high blood pressure and try to prevent its damaging effects to the walls of the blood vessels. Bisoprolol can be used. It's not the first line treatment for high blood pressure, but if other agents are failing to get it under control, then bisoprolol is one of the things that can be tried and added in. It's going to work by reducing sympathetic stimulation to the heart and thereby reducing heart rate, reducing cardiac contractility force, uh, and thereby through both of those mechanisms, it will reduce cardiac output and thereby reduce blood pressure. The more active the sympathetic nervous system is in this individual, i.e. the more stressed slash anxious a person they are, the more effective you can expect the drug to be. If there's someone who's quite relaxed and chilled, who probably has quite a quiescent sympathetic nervous system, then it might be the case that this drug is going to be less effective at reducing their blood pressure. However, you can still try it and see what effect it actually has. So now let's move on to number two on the list. Let's talk about sinus tachycardia and how bisoprolol can be used to treat this. So this is where the heart goes too fast due to too high sympathetic stimulation of the heart. So this is a condition that affects very anxious people, usually young women, and it results in such overactivity of the sympathetic nervous system that the heart at rest is going far too fast. So these people can be laid in bed and have a heart rate greater than 100. And indeed, that's the threshold for uh, being called a tachycardia. So when your heart rate is going greater than 100 and you are not exercising, you are at rest, so maybe laid in bed or sat in a chair, that's what we call tachycardia. When the tachycardia isn't due to some arrhythmia, some abnormality of electrical activity in the heart, and instead is just due to sympathetic overactivity making the sinoatrial node go too fast, we call that sinus tachycardia. Now, it is normal to get a sinus tachycardia in response to illness. So if you have got a bad flu and are laid in bed, then it is healthy for your sympathetic nervous system to be uh, more active than normal and to be driving the heart to beat faster. And the reason for that is you want a greater cardiac output to help heal you from this infection. However, when you are well, your heart rate should then go back to a normal rate. If, on the other hand, you have a permanent sinus tachycardia due to permanent anxiety levels, that is what we're talking about here as sinus tachycardia. I should stress also that we're talking about adults here. This threshold of greater than 100 as the definition of tachycardia, this only applies to adults. Children naturally have much faster heart rates, so please don't feel your baby's heart rate. Feel that it's going at 130 and suddenly decide that there's something wrong with your baby. No, that's normal for your baby. This is the threshold for being defined as tachycardia too fast in an adult human. So I talked earlier about how we don't use bisoprolol to treat anxiety, and that is true. However, if you have a permanent slash persistent sinus tachycardia that's due to an overactive sympathetic nervous system, we can treat that with bisoprolol, and indeed we do treat that with bisoprolol. 
Now you might ask, well, why do we need to treat this? Well, the reason is that if someone's heart rate is going too fast, i.e. over 100 or even worse, over 110 persistently, this can lead to the heart gradually being worn out and the muscle tissue of the heart can gradually get weaker and weaker over decades in life if this persists. So when someone has a problem with the muscle that makes up the walls of the heart, we call that a cardiomyopathy. So myo means muscle, cardio means heart, so cardiomyo means heart muscle, pathy means problem or disease, so this is a disease of the cardiac muscle. So if you have a long-term untreated sinus tachycardia, then this can, over years, gradually wear down the muscle of the heart and it can gradually degenerate and become overall weaker as the years go on and we will call this a cardiomyopathy. So sinus tachycardia, if left untreated, can result in a cardiomyopathy. And cardiomyopathy is then a massive risk factor for developing heart failure, which is where you become fluid overloaded due to a problem with the heart. So this is definitely something you want to avoid, and therefore it can be treated with bisoprolol. Bisoprolol will block the sympathetic effect on the heart and therefore slow the heart rate down and stop this wearing out process and hopefully stop the development of cardiomyopathy. So those were nice simple conditions to explain. Now we have a much more complicated condition, atrial fibrillation, or AF for short. So atrial fibrillation is a cardiac arrhythmia, meaning that it's an abnormality of the electrical activity of the heart. Now it's one of the more common of the arrhythmias and it usually affects elderly people. So in a healthy heart, the electrical activity of a heartbeat begins in the sinoatrial node, which is shown on this picture up here in the right atrium uh, in red. So electrical activity is initiated here, it spreads over the two atria, and this is representing the right atrium, this is representing the left atrium, and it makes both of the atria contract. The electrical activity then cannot pass across this atrioventricular septum here, except at one conduction point, which is the atrioventricular node, again shown in red here. So it arrives at the atrioventricular node, which then conducts it through to the ventricles. It goes down a conduction system here, and is then released onto both ventricles and makes the right ventricle and the left ventricle contract. That is the normal basics of the electrical activity of the heart. Now, over the course of life, the atria can degenerate. And one of the things that can happen when the atria degenerate is that different parts of the atria can decide that they actually fancy taking on the job of the sinoatrial node and they fancy creating their own electrical impulses. So these areas in blue here are now representing parts of the atria that are going to now start creating their own electrical signals the way the sinoatrial node would in a healthy heart. We call these electrical signals that are originating from other parts of the atria other than the sinoatrial node atrial ectopics. So if you end up with enough atrial ectopics, you can imagine that you're going to end up with absolute electrical chaos occurring within the atria. This electrical chaos is going to mean that the atria no longer contract in a coordinated fashion together. Instead, different parts of the atrial wall muscle are going to contract at different times. So instead, the effect that you're going to get is a sort of shuddering or a writhing, wriggling motion of the atrial wall muscle. That is what this word fibrillation means. It means rather than contracting nicely down in a coordinated fashion, instead the atrial walls are just sort of wriggling or shuddering around. So atrial fibrillation then, it's a condition of the elderly it has occurred because of degeneration of the atrial wall muscles. They're not what they once were, and it's resulted in electrical chaos occurring within the atria. And instead of contracting in a coordinated fashion, they just shudder. 
Now this arrhythmia is still compatible with life in contrast to if the ventricle was fibrillated. If you develop ventricular fibrillation, then that's not compatible with life, but atrial fibrillation is compatible with life. And the reason is that you don't actually need the atria to contract in order for the heart to work. In fact, many animals don't even have atria within their hearts, they just have the two ventricles. So as long as the two ventricles are still filling with blood and contracting and pushing it out into the pulmonary and systemic circulations respectively, you'll still have a circulation. So in atrial fibrillation, electrical activity is still going to be conducted from the atria through the atrioventricular node down to the ventricles to make the ventricles contract. Now, because the electrical activity up in the atria is now no longer regular and is instead chaos, when these signals are coming through from the atrioventricular node, is now going to be random, so it's going to result in an, in an irregular heartbeat. And indeed, many patients with atrial fibrillation know the condition as an irregular heartbeat. That's what they call it. They, they won't tell you they've got atrial fibrillation. They'll tell you they've got an irregular heartbeat. So in a patient with AF, it's very important that the rate at which electrical signals are being conducted through the atrioventricular node and going down to the ventricles is controlled. So when too many are being let through, then you can end up with the ventricles beating too often, i.e. you can end up with a tachycardia where the rate is going to be greater than 100. And we call this condition where atrial fibrillation is driving a too fast ventricular rate. We call that fast AF. The more proper name for it is to now call it atrial fibrillation with a fast ventricular rate. However, a lot of people still use this term fast AF. So you can see AF driving a ventricular rate of 120, 130. It can even go up to 150. So if fast AF is bad enough, then it can lead to a low cardiac output because if the ventricles are beating extremely rapidly, then they might not have time to actually relax back down in between beats. And of course, when they're relaxing back down, that's when they're refilling with blood. So if they haven't actually had time to relax back down and refill with blood before they're then being told to beat again and contract back down, then they're going to be ejecting only a very small amount of blood, which is the amount of blood they've already had time to fill back up with. Uh, so it can lead to reduced stroke volume and therefore reduced cardiac output. And low cardiac output can lead to low blood pressure, weakness all over, lightheadedness, floppiness, passing out, those sorts of things. So even if it doesn't cause circulatory instability, persistent fast AF, just like persistent sinus tachycardia can lead to damage to the heart wall muscle cardiomyopathy, which is then a massive risk factor for developing heart failure. So it's very important with individuals with atrial fibrillation that the ventricular rate is controlled. We call this rate control of AF. Now in some individuals with atrial fibrillation, the heart does it automatically. The AV node does a very good job of controlling the number of electrical signals that are passing through it and their heart goes nicely at the normal rate despite the atrial fibrillation. However, in other individuals, their AF doesn't rate control naturally and in those individuals we use bisoprolol to treat it. So in individuals with AF, they have a sympathetic nervous system too, which is going to be stimulating their hearts. And unfortunately, the sympathetic nervous system is really not helpful in these individuals with atrial fibrillation. It often worsens the electrical chaos that is occurring up in the atria, and it also uh, stimulates the atrioventricular node, allowing it to let through more electrical signals to the ventricles. So it worsens the electrical chaos up in the atria and makes it more likely that the electrical chaos up in the atria is going to be transmitted down to the ventricles at too fast a rate, leading to fast AF. So it's a very good idea to give people with atrial fibrillation bisoprolol. 
If they have fast AF, it usually successfully rate controls them by turning off the sympathetic stimulation to the AV node that is allowing too many of the impulses to be transmitted down to the ventricles. And in some individuals with atrial fibrillation, giving them bisoprolol will actually successfully rhythm control them, i.e. it will turn them back into a normal sinus rhythm. And the way that's happening is because it's cutting off the sympathetic stimulation to the atria that was driving the chaos in the first place. However, note that that doesn't happen in all individuals with atrial fibrillation. You're lucky if bisoprolol manages to convert them back into a sinus rhythm. Usually, if you cut off the sympathetic stimulation to the atria in an individual with atrial fibrillation, the electrical chaos will still be continuing. Uh, it's only in a few individuals that when you do that, the electrical chaos stops and it goes back to sinus rhythm. So the main use of bisoprolol in atrial fibrillation is to rate control atrial fibrillation, but be aware that in some individuals it will also achieve rhythm control and will keep them in a sinus rhythm and stop them going back into atrial fibrillation. And in those individuals that does successfully rhythm control it, if you then stop the drug, they may then go completely back into atrial fibrillation. So in those individuals, it would be an extremely important medication.